Professor Bogialli, who will say us something more about this uh, very important and nice initiative. Ecco, buongiorno eh, a tutti, vi porto i saluti della Società Chimica Italiana della Sezione Veneto di cui sono Presidente. È veramente con particolare gioia che vedo qualcuno in aula e che soprattutto vedo potersi realizzare una iniziativa, ehm, okay, vedo realizzare un'iniziativa eh, di diffusione della cultura chimica in questi due anni. Ecco, questo è un seminario di Frontiers, ok? E voi, eh, veramente gli insegnanti, siete stati effettivamente la frontiera eh, della diffusione della chimica in questi due anni presso i giovani. Eh, è solo grazie all'impegno, molti di voi sono stati sicuramente impegnati eh, nei giochi della chimica, che è l'unica iniziativa che siamo riusciti a portare avanti veramente con grandi sacrifici. E quindi la vostra capacità di trasmettere l'amore per la chimica, la curiosità, eh, per le scienze in generale se è possibile in questo periodo in cui i ragazzi sono stati veramente poco stimolati è di particolare pregio quindi veramente grazie a tutti approfitto qui per il vostro impegno ancora di più perché eh, in questo modo con il, le iniziative del, del PLS noi riusciamo a creare un ponte veramente importante tra eh, le scuole superiori e l'università nel cercare per l'appunto di stimolare e accattivare i ragazzi per qualcosa che Abbiamo visto anche in questi due anni dal punto di vista del pensiero scientifico è veramente importante, quindi sarà anche particolarmente importante eh, sentire il professor Sherry perché ci aiuterà a capire come arriviamo alla scienza, come ci avviciniamo alla chimica, quello che ci ha spinto fino adesso. Eh, quindi sono eh, veramente fiera anche di questi mezzi che forse stiamo utilizzando per la prima volta in maniera corretta, cioè cercando di stare insieme fisicamente ma approfittando di... Eh, di, 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 di possibilità che forse prima non sfruttavamo eh, grazie veramente a tutti insegnare eh, è una passione ma bisogna farlo anche nella maniera giusta perché abbiamo visto eh, abbiamo veramente bisogno di eh, riuscire a comunicare in questa era di comunicazioni alternative di riuscire a comunicare in maniera corretta quindi eh, grazie a tutti e grazie alla professoressa Oriana per questa iniziativa e spero che ci rivedremo presto insomma per altre iniziative per i giochi della chimica abbiamo in animo anche qui se riusciamo con tutte le, 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 le condizioni del caso di eh, tornare fisicamente anche per le prime azioni grazie grazie Sara um, so welcome Eric Cherry and uh, uh, let me say just a uh, uh, few words about uh, uh, your biography and I will switch to Italian Eric Cherry è un chimico è uno scrittore è un filosofo della scienza Insegna nel Dipartimento di Chimica e Biochimica dell'Università di California, Los Angeles. È fondatore e editor in chief di una rivista importante che si chiama Foundations of Chemistry e che si occupa di storia, di filosofia della chimica e di education. Ha studiato a Londra, a Cambridge, a Southampton, ha, ha fa fatto il PhD al King's College di Londra. È considerato uno dei maggiori esperti viventi, se non il maggiore, della tavola periodica. Lui sa tutto della tavola periodica. È stato coinvolto in tantissime iniziative della stessa IUPAC sulla tavola periodica. È risultato, secondo un ranking, il secondo scienziato più influente della decade 2010-2020, il secondo chimico. E quindi siamo veramente contenti che abbia accettato di eh, fare una lecture oggi per noi. Lui ha informato che la maggior parte del pubblico sono insegnanti della scuola secondaria, quindi persone che ogni giorno affrontano la missione di insegnare, divulgare la chimica e di orientare i giovani verso la chimica. Eh, ha scritto numerosi libri. Ve ne ricordo uno in particolare che è stato recentemente tradotto in italiano e edito da Piccin, che è la tavola periodica, una brevissima introduzione. Um, now I uh, uh, let Professor Sherry start his lecture and the title is A Brief History of the Elements and the Periodic Table. Thank you very much, Laura, uh, for this very kind introduction. Can I just ask, can people see my screen that I'm sharing? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, certainly. Right. Yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. 
so thank you very much, Lara, for all the organization leading up to this lecture. Mi sarebbe piaciuto molto fare questa presentazione in italiano, ma non parlo abbastanza bene l'italiano per farlo. So I'm, I'm sorry, but I will speak in English, although I understand Italian, but I don't, uh, I don't speak so well. Okay, so let me begin. First of all, as, wait a minute. As uh, Laura just mentioned, one, uh, one of these books has recently been translated into Italian by Cristina Della Pina, who is a professor of inorganic chemistry at the Univers Università degli Studi di, di Milano. And so I hope to give you some, uh, some new ideas on a familiar topic the periodic table that we all know and love so much, and which is of course the center of chemistry. It is of course the ultimate infographic. It is a graphic representation which packs a tremendous amount of information into the chart. It has of course become a scientific icon. It is represented in so many different places. For example, artists, have begun to adopt the periodic table and you find many, many examples such as this one from Blair Bradshaw. There is one of my favorites is the periodic table of football. This one comes from Brazil, the home of football, of course. Sometimes the home of football. I, I realize that now Italy is most recently the, the home of European football in any case. Um, the table of uh, guitarists etc etc there are hundreds and thousands of these these days here are some variations on the theme of the periodic table as you know the periodic table can be represented in a cyclic fashion as shown here there are three dimensional periodic tables this is by my friend roy alexander and pyramidal tables and and so on there are literally more than a thousand periodic tables that have been published in print or on the internet. There are some giant wall-sized periodic tables, such as this one from the University of Murcia in Spain. There is, of course, the very famous one at one of the institutes where Mendeleev worked in St. Petersburg in Russia. So how should we chemists and chemical educators react to all the attention that the periodic table is getting? And as of course, you know, in 2019 was the 150th anniversary and there were special issues and books and so on. What, how, how should we react? Well, of course, we should embrace the attention that the periodic table is getting because chemistry, as we also know, needs all the positive public relations it can get. I'm happy to report that popular books on the periodic table have now begun to catch up with popular books on physics and biology. For many years, if you went into a bookshop and you looked for chemistry, there might be one or two books buried within hundreds of books on biology and physics. Why the difference? Why is chemistry such a neglected science in the popular imagination? Well, I could give an entire lecture on that subject, but I'm not going to be doing that. Of course, the periodic table is the paradigm. It's the framework. It's the organizing principle for chemistry. Now, just to say a little bit on philosophical aspects of chemistry, the popular view until recently has been that physics and biology have big ideas. For instance, physics has quantum mechanics and relativity theory. Biology has Darwin's theory of evolution. But chemistry, it was considered not to have any big ideas. Now, of course, that's incorrect. Chemistry has at least two big ideas. The periodic table is a huge, concept in chemistry. Chemical bonding is another very, very important philosophical idea. And of course, the two are intimately related. 
These days, there is some attention on the philosophy of chemistry. I'm showing you here some of the covers on books on the philosophy of chemistry, including the most recent one, What is a Chemical Element?, which I co-edited with an Italian professor, Elena Gibaudi from Torino, who may be listening to this lecture. I hope she is. Now, when it comes to chemical education, my personal view, and of course I'm, I'm biased in this, is that the periodic table could be made into the unifying motif, the main strand running through general chemistry courses. Of course it's there, but it could be enhanced. So we could make use of all the popularity of the periodic table. So what I would suggest doing in general chemistry courses or chemistry courses is to begin with the periodic table as it was discovered according to the properties of elements and their compounds. And then later to move to a discussion of atomic structure and explaining the periodic table through quantum mechanics and the structure of the atom. Now, there is an expression in English, I don't know if you have the equivalent in Italian, of don't put the cart before the horse. You should put the horse before the cart. Okay, and what I mean in this context is we should put the periodic table and chemistry first, and then atomic structure and the explanation for the periodic table that comes from quantum mechanics. But very often these days, we seem to teach atomic structure and quantum theory before teaching chemistry. I believe, and many other chemical educators believe that this is a mistake. Now, one of the things I wanna to do today in my limited time is to talk about briefly about any remaining open questions having to do with the periodic table. The periodic table is not a closed book. Right? It's not a finished story. It is developing constantly. And these are some of the things that can be used to make chemical education more interesting, perhaps, or even to keep our own interest going as chemical educators. As you know, quantum mechanics is generally believed to explain the periodic table in a fundamental way. At least this is how it's taught in high school and in college chemistry. I'm gonna to suggest to you that quantum mechanics does not explain everything about the periodic table. Now, let me start at the very beginning. What do we mean by chemical periodicity? What we mean is that if we arrange the elements in a line, here I'm using atomic number to arrange the elements, every so often we have an approximate repetition in the properties of the elements. For example, we have lithium at number three, and then we move through the elements. And when we arrive at sodium 11, we have an approximate repetition of lithium. When we arrive at number 19, we have another repetition, not exact, of course, but approximate. They're similar in their properties. Now we can turn this one dimensional order into a two dimensional table like this. Can I, can I ask a question? Is it possible not to hear the noise when anyone is admitted it from the waiting room? If it's possible, if somebody could switch that off, because we're, I think we're all hearing beep, 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 every, like that. You can't hear it? I'm hearing it. Maybe it's because I'm one of the co-hosts. Okay, no problem. So I've gone from a one dimensional line into a two dimensional table, the beginning of a table. You notice I stopped at manganese number 25. Why do I stop at manganese? Because I can't do this. If I try and put iron into the periodic table now, there's a problem. Why? Because iron is not a noble gas. So how did the discoverers of the periodic table cope with this problem? Well, they coped with this problem, Mendeleev in 18, 71, but even before that, he took iron 
and cobalt and nickel. And as you can see, he put them into a separate group eight, all three of them in one column. After that, copper, which is okay because copper has a valence of one and then zinc has a valence of two. And so everything is okay again by just excluding these three elements. And then you have to exclude three more elements, ruthenium, rhodium, palladium, and then again, osmium, iridium, platinum. So this strange group in which some elements are excluded, as it were, from the main table. Now, these days, we don't do that. These days we use not an eight column table, but an 18 column table. And we have groups, the iron group, the cobalt group, and the nickel group shown here. And many other new groups have been created because there are more similarities, for example, between titanium and zirconium and hafnium than there are with the elements carbon, whoops, I went the wrong way, with the elements carbon and so on in that group four. Okay, now in doing that, we are still excluding a number of elements. In fact, 28 elements you can see shown in yellow at the bottom here. Why are they excluded? Well, the simple answer is to make the periodic table not too wide, okay? But it's not a big problem to make it wider. And many textbooks these days are showing the periodic table in an expanded 32 column periodic table where the F block is naturally incorporated into the main body of the table. So we don't have the confusion now of why there is a break between barium and lutetium and radium and laurentium, as you see on this kind of periodic table. Okay, let me take a little drink and then I will continue with a brief history of the periodic table. a very brief history. I'm gonna start with John Dalton. John Dalton was the first to assign atomic weights. He revived the atomic theory of the ancient Greek philosophers, but he also gave weights to the elements, hydrogen equals one. And then as you can see for him, oxygen was seven, for us it's 16, of course, sulfur equals 13 and so on. Once these atomic weights had been published, it became possible to use two important ideas, which as I say on this page, two ideas leading up to the periodic table, contributing to the discovery of the eventual periodic table. And these two ideas, I'm sure are very familiar to you, but I want to analyze them a little bit. Triads of elements and Prout's hypothesis. Now, as you know, a triad of elements, for instance, lithium, sodium, potassium, one of the elements, sodium in this case, is the average of the flanking elements in two respects. It has the average atomic weight approximately, as shown here on the left, and it has the average or intermediate chemical reactivity. Now, this is a very fundamental discovery that was made by Doberiner, he discovered other triads, such as the chlorine bromine iodine triad, sulfur selenium tellurium, etc. Now, this is not an exact relationship, it's an approximate relationship. You can see the comparison here that the average of these is 81.19, whereas the actual weight of bromine is 79.9 something. And similarly for the other triad, it's not exact. As a result, there was a decline in interest in triads, although many people were attracted to the idea and other people be believed it was too approximate and that it was too much like numerology. And so the idea fell out of favor. So again, let me show you three of the triads of Doberiner, but now think about this. If instead of using atomic weight, we use atomic number, which as you know, is the better criterion for ordering the elements. Now the triads are exact. They're not approximate anymore. 
the, look at the chlorine bromine iodine trial. 17 plus 53 divided by two is exactly 35. And of course it has to be exact because we're now dealing with number of protons, which is a whole number. Okay, let me turn to the other important philosophical idea that contributed to the discovery of the periodic table. William Prout was a Scottish medical doctor working in London with a big interest in chemistry. He noticed something quite obvious. If you look at the weights of all the elements, this is the weights he considered. They're not exactly our weights. You can see that many elements are whole number multiples of the weight of hydrogen, which is taken to be one, of course. Now, there are many exceptions. Beryllium, boron, uh, nitrogen, uh, sodium. Okay, these are old values. Don't worry if you, if you see unfamiliar values here. But the fact remains, many of them are whole numbers. So this is Prout's hypothesis, that all the elements are composites or multiples of hydrogen. All the elements are made of hydrogen. Again, this idea was initially attractive, but very soon it was refuted. It was shown to be incorrect. I like to quote from Karl Popper, the philosopher here, who says it's not so much if an idea is right or wrong. What's important is if the idea is refutable, if it can be shown to be incorrect. And of course, Bezelius and Stas and many others showed that Proud's hypothesis was incorrect. And yet, Proud's hypothesis, a bit like triads, has made a return in a modified way. It's made a comeback because all atoms are composites of hydrogen, if we think just of protons. In astrophysics, we learn from astrophysicists that the elements were literally formed from hydrogen and helium combining. Two hydrogens make a helium, and in principle, two heliums make beryllium, etc. So Proud's hypothesis and triads have made comebacks or return. It's a strange situation where an idea is refuted and then returns in a modified sense. Now, interestingly, Dmitry Mendeleev, the main discoverer of the periodic table, disliked both of these ideas. He disliked Prout's hypothesis because it suggested the unity of all matter. And to him, this was like mysticism. He also claimed that he disliked triads because it had misled the early pioneers of the periodic table. But Mendeleev himself used triads. He published this little diagram and he said, if you want to find the atomic weight of selenium in the middle here, you can do it by adding the atomic weights of not just two flanking elements, but the four flanking elements. If you add them and divide by four, you get 79. And the measured atomic weight at the time of selenium was 78. So it's a good way to predict the atomic weight of a particular element. So here Mendeleev is using triads with a vengeance. He's using triads like this and triads like this. But he claimed that he didn't like triads. Having said that, we should remember that Mendeleev also was very, very conservative, scientifically speaking. He rejected many things that we now believe are correct. He, he rejected atomic theory. He didn't think that atoms really existed. Valence theory, initially, he rejected the idea. When the electron was discovered, he didn't believe it. Radioactivity, he was very skeptical of radioactivity. When the noble gases were discovered, he would have nothing to do with them initially, and so on. I move on historically to 1860. You may know it was a famous conference in Karlsruhe, Germany, in which the Italian chemist and physicist Canizzaro was very influential because he published a set of atomic weights which were taken by other people as definitive and an improvement on previous atomic weights. So I like to say that this opened the door for the discovery of the periodic table. And it's important to realize that it's a multiple discovery. 
It's not just Mendeleev who discovered the periodic table. I have a, a book called The Tale of Seven Scientists in which I make a case for simultaneous discovery. The periodic table is a perfect example. And by simultaneous, I don't mean in the same minutes, the same hour, I mean over a period of a few years. And I make a case for the importance of minor contributors. For example, in the case of the periodic table, there are at least six people who can be said to have discovered the periodic table. I show here the flags of the countries that they were from. Clearly, the first discovery of chemical periodicity came from France, from Émile Bégayet de Chancourtois. And then, in rapid succession over a period of about six or seven years, Newlands in England, Heinrichs from Denmark, but he had emigrated to the United States, Odling in England, Lothar Meyer in Germany, and the last of the discoverers was Dmitry Mendeleev from Russia. Here is the first of these periodic tables. And notice the world's first periodic table is a three-dimensional periodic table. This is the so-called telluric screw of Bégayet de Chancourtois. Newland's table. If you notice, I hope you can see the small asterisks that I place here to show that Newlands correctly placed tellurium before iodine, even though tellurium had a higher weight than iodine. This is a famous example of a pair reversal. It's not only Mendeleev who did this. Heinrichs had this periodic system. I don't think we would call this a table. It's more like a bicycle wheel, but a very consistent periodic system. Odling in England, again, Odling also placed tellurium before iodine, and you can see it more clearly here. Even though tellurium had an atomic weight of 129 and sh should have come after iodine, according to the weights, he reversed them because of the chemical similarities. Tellurium is like selenium and sulfur and oxygen, and so on. Lothar Meyer from Germany also put tellurium before iodine. They all did this. This is not just a triumph of Mendeleev. Mendeleev is the sixth and final discoverer. Now, of course, Mendeleev gets much more credit than the other people because he made predictions. Here I show the famous three predictions. He predicted an element of atomic weight 44, one of 68, one of 72, and one of 100. Those three it's shown in red, were discovered within a period of 15 years. And Mendeleev became even more famous. The one with an atomic weight of 100 is actually the only element discovered in Italy. This is technetium, discovered or synthesized and uh, first, first analyzed in actually in Sicily. Technetium. OK, now talking about prediction. I was saying that Mendeleev is, gets the most credit because of his famous predictions. But now let me just back up a little bit and discuss the question of prediction as opposed to retrodiction, sometimes called accommodation. Which one counts more in the acceptance of a scientific discovery? In the popular imagination, prediction is everything because prediction, correct prediction, is almost saying that the scientist knows the future, knows the secrets of nature to be able to make a prediction. However, in the philosophy of science and in the history of science, there's been a long debate as to whether prediction really counts more than retrodiction, also called accommodation. Let me give you a brief example. This is now from, from physics, from the general theory of relativity. There were two important tests for the general theory of relativity. One of them was that if a beam of light passes close to the sun, it will be deflected just a little bit. Einstein predicted the deflection to be 1.75 seconds of arc. 
A few years later, Eddington conducted some experiments during a solar eclipse, and he found that the deflection was 1.98 approximately. Einstein became famous almost overnight. There were reports in the Times of London, the New York Times, and many places. Now, what's interesting is that Einstein's general theory of relativity also explained or retrodicted. Now, this one is not a prediction because this was already known for 150 years. This is the advance of the perihelion of Mercury. It was known that Newton's theory could not explain 43 seconds of arc of advance of the perihelion of Mercury. Einstein's theory is able to explain 42.9, very, very close to the 43.11. Okay. Now, for the general public, the dramatic prediction shown on the left here was what convinced them that Einstein was right. But for the scientists, the advance of the perihelion of Mercury, even though it was not a prediction in the literal sense of prediction, this was taken more seriously. Why? Because for one thing, this experiment had been conducted for 150 years, or this discrepancy was known for 150 years. It was a stable experimental piece of information. In the other case, Eddington was the only one who made this measurement initially. Eddington was a friend of Einstein. Let me go back to Mendeleev and chemistry. Here again are the three predictions made by, the successful predictions made by Mendeleev, and they were named scandium, gallium, and germanium, as I'm sure you're aware. Whoops, what am I doing here? Okay, now, still on the question of prediction. If prediction is so important, we should consider all of the predictions that Mendeleev made, not just the successful ones. And if you look at all the predictions, he made 16 predictions. He was only successful in eight of the 16. 50% success rate. That's not so good, right? Astrologers can have 50% success rate, right? And this is not supposed to be astrology. This is supposed to be science. So I'm just pointing out that there is too much emphasis that is placed on successful prediction. And this is a debate that is ongoing in philosophy of science. Moving historically, in 1894, a discovery which made that spells trouble for the periodic table. This is the discovery of the element argon. It had an atomic weight of 40, which meant that there was no place to put it in the periodic table. If you look below on my diagram, you see that there is already an element of atomic weight 40. Calcium has atomic weight 40. So where are you gonna put this new element that's discovered, which has exactly the same atomic weight? There was confusion about whether the element was monoatomic or diatomic. Up to that point, all the gases were diatomic, O2, H2, N2, chlorine to, etc. And now a discovery of something that's monoatomic. It caused confusion. And maybe most important of all, it was completely unreactive, which led some people to suggest it didn't even belong on the periodic table. Okay. Then things got even worse for the periodic table because helium, neon, krypton, and xenon were discovered. Is this the end of the periodic table? Because the periodic table did not predict these elements. Mendeleev did not predict these elements. Of course, it was not the end of the periodic table because Ramsey himself realized that you could make a new column. Here he is in a cartoon pointing to his new column, which contains the noble gases. And everything was okay. And Mendeleev welcomed this suggestion because it meant that his periodic table was capable of accommodating these new elements. He changed his mind from initially rejecting the element to accepting it and welcoming the whole group of elements. Now, just as a, a point of interest, it is not well known that actually one or two people did predict the noble gases. For example, Julius Thompson, a Danish chemist, and if you look at this, he predicted 
all the known noble gases to a remarkable degree of accuracy. This is almost unbelievable. Helium, he predicted an element, this is before the discovery of the noble gas, an element of atomic weight four. It does have atomic weight approximately four. Neon, argon, krypton, xenon, even organesson, which is thought to have an approximate atomic weight of 294, he predicted 292. Average error, 1.6%. Moving on historically, physics begins to invade chemistry or begins to invade the periodic table at the turn of the 20th century, when in rapid succession, Röntgen discovered X-rays, Becquerel discovered radioactivity, J.J. Thompson discovered the electron. These three discoveries were to have a profound impact on chemistry and on the periodic table and how we understand the periodic table. Whoops, let me go back to one. And of course, there are many other important discoveries. Rutherford discovering the structure of the atom, the Curies doing further experiments on radioactivity, discovering two elements. Then came an important discovery of Moseley, the discovery of atomic number, which produced a better ordering principle than atomic weights. I mentioned this earlier. It resolved the question of pair reversals. Now there was a justification, an independent justification for placing, for instance, cobalt before nickel. Even though cobalt has a higher atomic weight than nickel, it is correctly placed before because it has a lower atomic number. There are a total of four pair reversals. The ones shown in blue were known at the time of Mendeleev. The ones shown in red were not known. So the problem was not very severe, right? Uh, argon had not been discovered initially and protactinium PA had not been discovered. So there were really two pair reversals. And as I mentioned earlier, they were accommodated on chemical grounds, but the really independent justification for making that reversal came from Mosley. Another, I wonder, if, I wonder if you could mute yourselves. Somebody is typing, excuse me for <laughs> making that request. Um, when Mosley made his discovery that I've just been describing, it became realized that there were precisely seven elements missing between hydrogen element one and uranium element 92. And these are the seven missing elements. Technetium, the Italian element, hafnium, rhenium, astatine, francium, etc. I have a book describing these, the discovery and the properties and the chemistry of these seven elements. And this has been translated into Italian by uh, Raffaele Pisano and his colleague Paolo Buzzotti. Continuing my quick overview of the history, the old quantum theory of Planck and Einstein and Bohr led to the idea that the electrons are orbiting the nucleus in shells. And even with the old quantum theory of 1913 by Niels Bohr, it became possible for the first time to explain the periodic table. Right? And the explanation of course is according to the number of outer shell electrons. So in these electronic configurations, Bohr was using just one quantum number, not four, one quantum number, main shell, right? This is the elementary model we teach in high school, for example. And so you could argue that lithium and sodium and potassium were all chemically similar or all in the same group because they all had one outer electron. Okay, explanation for the periodic table. Then came quantum mechanics contributions from many, many people, some of which are depicted on these stamps, Pauli, Heisenberg, Schrodinger, Dirac, Fermi, etc. De Broglie in France. As a result of these pioneers, it was realized that we needed four quantum numbers, not just one. And from the relationship between these four quantum numbers, it became possible to predict rigorously that the first shell should contain two electrons, the next shell 
eight electrons, the next shell 18 electrons. We teach this to students, of course. Okay, so this is a fundamental explanation of the periodic table from physics, from quantum physics. Now, physicists became very ambitious, very bold, very arrogant. One physicist said, now physics is cap capable of eating chemistry with a spoon. Okay, physics explains everything. But unfortunately for the physicist, it doesn't explain everything. Admittedly, the closing of the shells takes place at 2, 8, 18, 32, etc. But the closing of the periods, which is more relevant chemically and more relevant for the periodic table, doesn't take place at exactly these numbers. It takes place at 2, 10, 18, 36, 54, the noble gases. Okay, why the difference? Well, it's no mystery. The two sets of values I'm showing here do not coincide because the shells do not fill one after the other sequentially. They fill diagonally. And this is something else we teach to students. In, in the English speaking world, it's called the Madelung rule. I don't know what, what it's called in Italy. There are various names in different countries. In France, it's called the Kleczkowski rule. In Mexico, I recently learned it's got another name. In any case, you know the rule. Diagonal filling, not horizontal filling. It is not a case of sequential filling. Interestingly, this very simple rule of N plus L in, the, in 1969, which was the 100th anniversary of the discovery of the periodic table, the famous Swedish chemist Lovdin made this remark. It is remarkable that in quantum theory, the simple Madelung rule has not yet been derived from first principles, meaning from quantum mechanics. So until this is explained by quantum mechanics, there is not yet a fundamental, a completely fundamental explanation for the periodic table. 50 years later, it has still not been derived from first principles. Many people have tried. There are many attempts to do this derivation. The Lovdin challenge still stands. The periodic table, as I just suggested, is not fully explained by quantum mechanics. Now, there are some people, some physicists, who are attempting to use group theory rather than quantum mechanics to explain this rule. But this is a project that has not yet been uh, achieved. Let me switch a little bit. I see that I'm running out of time, but I'm to relativistic quantum mechanics, which is becoming more and more important these days. And this is another threat, perhaps, we're not sure yet, another apparent threat to the periodic table of the elements. The question becomes, do the elements with high atomic numbers behave in the way that they should behave according to the periodic table. In addition, such things as the color of gold and the fact that mercury is a liquid are now explained using relativity theory. Not just quantum mechanics, but relativistic quantum mechanics. But let me come back to what I said about, do the elements behave like they should? When Rutherfordium and dubnium were first discovered, and when their chemical properties were examined, it was found that rutherfordium did not behave like hafnium and zirconium. Dubnium did not behave like tantalum and niobium. Dubnium behaves more like protactinium. Rutherfordium behaves more like plutonium. Okay, so unexpected things seem to happen because of relativistic effects. So relativity is in danger of, or there is a danger that relativity will, will destroy the periodic table with high atomic numbers. But it is not conclusive yet, because for example, if we look at element number 112, Copernicium, and if you look on this graph, there is the sublimation enthalpy for the elements of group 12. You can see that it's an almost perfect straight line going through the data points. So Copernicium does behave in the way that it should, according to the periodic table. I wrote an article in Scientific American 
And the illustration that was commissioned by the editors was this, the periodic table just collapsing. It's a bit of an exaggeration, but of course it gives you the idea of what, what begins to happen with high atomic numbers. This, by the way, if you prefer to read it in Italian, was translated in, in, in Le Scienze. Crepe nella tavola periodica. Is there such a thing as an optimal periodic table? Is there a best possible periodic table? I'm gonna discuss one good candidate for the best periodic table. This is due to Charles Janet, a French engineer, and it dates back from the 1930s, but it's become increasingly popular these days. You take the normal periodic table, shown in 32 column form, and you move helium from its traditional position to here at the top of the S block next to hydrogen. And then you make a cut of the whole S block shown by the dotted lines here. And you take the S block and you put it on the right hand margin of the periodic table. And you arrive at this, the left step periodic table. If we compare it to the traditional periodic table in 32 column format, you can see one when more than one, but at least one advantage. In the normal table, there is a very strange anomaly. All the period lengths repeat, except for the very first one. We have 8, 8, 18, 18, 32, but only two. Now look at the left step table, 2, 2, 8, 8, 18, 18. So it has more regularity. And to some people, it's a suggestion that this is a more fundamental table. Also, it follows the N plus L or Madelung rule more precisely because each period is one of these lines. Each period is a value of N plus L. Now, what's the disadvantage? It should be fairly obvious. The disadvantage to a chemical uh, perspective is the placing of helium in a group of elements that are quite reactive, right? Helium is supposed to be the most unreactive of the noble gases. So why should we put it in group two? <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> well, my answer to that is to point you to an article published recently in which it was shown that helium does form some compounds, a very simple compound, Na2 helium. This has to be done at very high pressure, but it does show that helium does react. So it's not out of the question to move helium to group two. Let me go back to triads for a moment and show you an interesting situation with triads. All these colored strips that I'm showing are examples of atomic number triads. And you'll notice that in all of these cases on the right-hand side of the periodic table, a triad occurs if the second and third periods are of equal lengths. For example, silicon, germanium, and tin, right? Silicon is in a period of eight, germanium and tin are in periods of 18. So the second and third of those periods have equal length. But on the left-hand side of the periodic table, something strange occurs. If we take the lithium, sodium, potassium triad, it's the first and second element that are in periods of equal length, lithium, is in a period of eight, sodium is in a period of eight, potassium is in a period of 18. Why the difference? Why the anomaly? The triads there are different from triads here. Well, the answer is, if we go to the, period, uh, the left step periodic table, everything is regular. Absolutely all triads, even in the F block, now have second and third periods of equal length. So here's another point in favor of the left step periodic table. When I said optimal periodic table, maybe not quite the right word, maybe the most fundamental periodic table, the most philosophical periodic table, the one that agrees the most, the most with the Madelung rule. Okay. This is gonna be my last topic. I know I'm running slightly over time, but if you will indulge me a little bit longer. Another open question these days is, should group three of the periodic table consist of scandium, yttrium, lanthanum, actinium, or 
you see on many periodic tables, scandium, yttrium, lutetium, laurentium. So you either see it like this, or sometimes you see it like this. Is one more correct than the other? There is a big debate going on for the last 10, 15 years on this question. And it's a difficult question to resolve because it turns out that chemical properties, physical properties have not been able to resolve which is the more correct. Even if we consider the electronic configurations of these four elements, we do not get a clear resolution of this question. I have suggested a resolution which doesn't depend on chemical or physical or electronic properties. Two simple requirements. One, present the periodic table in a 32 column format, as I've been doing in many of my slides. Second, insist on an increase in atomic number across all periods. Okay. If you show group three with lanthanum and actinium, then you immediately see a problem because now the elements are not arranged in order of increasing atomic number. You can see here, oops, let me go back. Uh, Ytterbium number 70 and then lutetium 71 and then 57 and then 72 and 73. Or on the next period, 102, 103, 89, 104. But if you put lutetium and Lorentzium in those positions, everything works perfectly. 70, 71, 72, 102, 103, 104. Okay, so this is an argument in favor of placing lutetium and Lorentzium in that group. Unfortunately, there's a third way to do it. And the third way is to still maintain lanthanum and actinium in group three, but now to split the D block into two portions, one group, group three, then the F block, and then the nine remaining blocks, uh, the nine remaining groups of the D block. So to some people, this is a little unnatural. This is the only time we do this in the periodic table. Okay, but of course, strange things happen in chemistry. It doesn't have to be completely regular. And to make things even worse, the sometimes described as official UPAC periodic table has this arrangement. UPAC puts nothing in those two positions, right? So UPAC doesn't commit itself either to one or the other, group three. And for UPAC, the F block is 15 elements wide, not 14. All right, so we have four possible options. Some of us have proposed that this is the best version, the one I showed you second. In other words, scandium, yttrium, lutetium, and laurentium, and a 14 element wide F block. Um, UPAC convened a working group. I happen to be the chairperson of this working group. We have not resolved this issue. There's many, many disagreements. I've given you my view, but other people disagree. And I want to thank you very much for listening. And I hope there'll be time for a few questions. Thank you very much for your attendance. Anybody have a question? Thank you very much. So I, I have people from home to write uh, questions in the chat. I think it is easier to... Okay. Also in Italian, of course, uh, questions, comments, uh, and, uh, and why we wait uh, that? So, Silvana, thank you very much for your presentation. Very interesting presentation. So, <laughs> yes, indeed, very interesting presentation. Of course, there are also some of my colleagues. Uh, also, they are invited to. Grazie, grazie, Silvana. Good question. So, Alessandra asks, some researchers hope to find what they call an island of stability 
that is a region in which the elements would be super heavy elements with a longer life. Do you think it exists? Um, it has already been found that there is a slightly longer lifetime of elements in the region of 114, slightly longer, by which I mean microseconds as opposed to nanoseconds. So although for many years, it was expected that there would be some, re some seriously stable elements, this has not materialized, or it has materialized to a very, very small extent. Okay, another question by Maria Lauretta. Thank you for the presentation. While we're talking, I noticed one thing. All periods begin with elements with the um, prime number as an as atomic number, except cesium. Do you know if there is, a, is there a special reason for this? Um, I don't think there's anything significant in that, but I do know that there is a South African chemist, his name is Boyens, who had an entire theory based on this. And I would be happy to send you uh, some references to his articles. The, the, the general opinion is this is just coincidence and numerology. But who knows? He examines the prime numbers in the entire periodic table and he claims that there are some patterns. I don't believe it. Many other people don't believe it, but we will, we will have to see. Thank you for your question. Any more questions, curiosities? Yes, please. You can come here. So there is a question from the participants. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the talk. It was very interesting. And uh, among the things you said, there's something that sparked my interest. Uh, you pointed out that um, we think that th this model, this paradigm of interpretation is powerful because of its predictive uh, power. But you show us that it wasn't such a perfect prediction and it was an optimal prediction. Um, it's also a good way to explain what we know, but also it's not perfect. Um, so why do you think it became such a powerful paradigm? And um, you sort of suggested that these framework, uh, even though it's a really powerful idea, might change, might be put in crisis by, um, um, relative, uh, by the relativity. Um, so can you elaborate a little bit on that and on why do you think this paradigm won and, and what perspective it might have? Okay. I did not want to in any way diminish the importance and the power of the periodic table. My point about Mendeleev was, should he should Mendeleev be the most famous only because of his successful predictions? And my answer is no. Accommodation of elements is just as important. For instance, Lothar Meyer did not make any important predictions. I believe he predicted one element which came out to be correct. I think germanium. He predicted germanium. So the usual story is Mendeleev is the, the clever guy because he made the predictions. Lothar Meyer was afraid to make predictions. And so uh, Mendeleev is the winner. I and some others are proposing that this is an incorrect view. One, because predictions are not all that important. They are important in the popular imagination, but not in the scientific, to the scientific mind. Um, in, the, in the case of relativity, bear in mind that relativity theory only destroys the periodic table, but even that wording is a little too strong threatens the periodic table with very high atomic numbers, over 100. Okay, so the periodic table is perfectly good up to, let's say, 100. So I'm not trying to in any way diminish the importance of the periodic table. It is hugely important. It is the most important thing in chemistry, as I said at the beginning. But it's interesting to look at the extreme limits of the periodic table. And just in the same way that noble gases threatened it and it survived, we, we are seeing that in some instances, even relativity theory has not defeated the periodic table. I hope that answers some of your, your points. Okay, there is uh, another uh, little question by Emilia. 
What about the contribution of Avogadro? Ah, uh, I apologize for not mentioning Avogadro. Uh, extremely important contribution for, uh, as you all know, um, the, for instance, the fact that water is H2O as opposed to HO, as Dalton believed, comes straight out of at the Avogadro research and the Avogadro hypothesis. Extremely important. And of course, Canizzaro was reviving the work of Avogadro when he made his important speech at the Karlsruhe conference. So yes, Avogadro was also key. There's a limit to how much can be said in 45 minutes. Okay. I think that if there is time for another couple of questions, we have one more by Silvana. About predictions, do you think new elements will be found or did we reach the end of the periodic table? I think it's a very nice question. I think that elements 119 and 120 will be found quite soon. It becomes more and more difficult, but there's no reason to think that 118 is the end of the story. And there are experiments at the moment going on in, in Russia to try and find 119 and 120. And who knows, maybe even beyond. As the technology advances, these very unstable elements uh, are formed and can be characterized. So I don't see the limit. Of course, okay. there must be a limit somewhere. Some predictions are that limit is 172. But this seems like science fiction to me. OK. And uh, uh, I read the, the last. Uh, why do you think there is not so much philosophy about chemistry comparing with other sciences? Uh, well, because, because of the popular belief that physics explains all of chemistry, not just the periodic table. And if, if physics is able to explain all of chemistry, then it's physics that's the most fundamental one. And so why should philosophers be interested in something less fundamental, something more superficial, maybe? A completely incorrect view in my, in my mind. And I've spent uh, you know, many, many years trying to promote the philosophy of chemistry. Chemistry in its own right is an important science. It's the central science. And funnily enough, it is often ignored or has been ignored by philosophers. It's as if they went from realizing that they were paying too much attention to physics, they went to the other end of the spectrum to biology, which of course is important, it's the science of life, and chemistry, which is in the middle, was uh, neglected. But I think, I think we're catching up now. And okay. Eric, do you think we have time? They added two more questions, but I think no more because it's getting very late uh, sure. in Los Angeles. So oh, that's okay. I can continue if, if you're okay. I just don't want to infringe on the rest of the program. Let me look at the other two questions. Oh, no, no, no. We, we have time. We have okay. time. I am just worried because I know that it's one o'clock in the morning. So okay. if you can answer, yeah. because they, they seem very happy. Uh, so uh, Claudio asks, dear Professor Sherry, I'd like you spend some other word about shifting group one on the right side of the table. Well, it's not just group one, it's group one and group two, by the way. Uh, let me try and get back to it if I can. Yeah. Um, well, here, here's one version of it, okay? It's a very regular table. It's a very elegant table. And in a way, this is, this is saying that physics and... Re um, what am I trying to say? This, this is a, a concession to physics because it's saying it, is, it may be correct because it's more regular, okay? The more we go towards physics and the, and the more fundamental science, the more we find regularity. And so this, this could also be thought of as the physicist's periodic table. Only physicists would dare to put helium in group two, a chemist has an instinctive reaction against putting helium in group two. But in electronic terms, of course, it's perfectly reasonable because helium has two electrons and the elements in group two have two outer electrons. But that's a physics way of looking at things, not a chemistry way of looking at things. 
So one of the interesting aspects of the whole study of the periodic table is the tension between physics and chemistry, right? The, if you look at it from a chemical point of view, you might choose a different periodic table. If you're a physicist or you look at it from the fundamentalist, a fundamental re reductionist point of view, you might be attracted to this left step periodic table. So yeah, it's groups one and two, not just, not just uh, one that have been shifted to the right. Okay, so, so far uh, the questions came from the professors of the secondary school. Uh, but now the last question is by a young colleague of mine here at the university, Manuel. And it's a very fundamental question. Why should we see physics and chemistry as a separated subjects? Oh, well, to some extent they are separated. Uh, history is, has just made them separate. They're in different buildings. They, do, they use different techniques. Chemists look at properties, macroscopic properties like smell, color, reactivity. Physicists more and more look at the very, very microscopic elementary particles, quarks. I mean, how much difference would you like? There, there is a huge difference between them. Of course, there's no sharp distinction. There's no way of putting a line and saying, this is chemistry, this is physics. There is much cooperation between the two sciences. But surely there is a difference. Does that, okay. does that satisfy the questioner or does that? Yeah, yeah, thank you. So it was just more of a, like, yes, more of a, you know, provocation. Historically, physics and chemistry was not so separated at the beginning, right? And then it became more and more apparent. Uh, and I, think, I think you're right. In some extent, they are so different, but in some other, they are like so close. Uh, it's true that we, in chemistry, even in areas of chemistry, which are not so, let's say, uh, close to, to physics, or, or let's see, we, we would think so, like, like, you know, organic chemistry or biophysics, they are maybe um, so far away from the normal concept of physics that we have like quantum mechanics and so on, but still quantum mechanics can explain this and, or at least part of this. And, also, yeah. Yeah. The, the truth is maybe that we still don't know everything, so we cannot really judge whether they can be fully the same thing or not. Even yeah. sometimes it looks to me like we are like forcing ourselves to put all of the elements in a table, uh, which is great, and we need this probably. But maybe still this is going to change again. As you say, it's continuously changing, and we are finding new way and best way to do this uh, over yeah. and over. So. Yeah, but I think we will still be putting all the elements in the table. I don't think that will change. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your question. An interesting uh, question and, and very relevant to, uh, to chemical education, of course, because you can teach chemistry as chemistry or you can teach chemistry as if it was nothing but physics. I prefer teaching chemistry as chemistry and then discussing, as I was saying, put don't put the cart before the horse. Put the horse I, chemistry first, and then. I absolutely agree. I, I agree. I mean, I'm in organic chemistry. I don't do nothing like physics or anything like that. But still, yeah. sometimes is you know. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sherry. Uh, this is Gordon Kennedy. Um, I uh, I work with schools here in the in the Veneto, uh, and I am a chemist, and so I have a a certain experience of, let's say, the difficulty in communicating things. Um, I just wanted to make a comment. Is it switched on? Oops, we're having microphone problems, it would appear. Can you hear me? Uh, we didn't hear the end of, we didn't hear your question. Or your okay, question. can you hear me now? Yes. Right, okay. Um, sorry, I made a little bit of a, an introductory preamble, but I just have a comment about the, uh, the slide that you're showing at the moment. So I'm just moving back to the idea of putting helium in group two. And it came to, it came to my mind that as chemists, we tend to look at the world at standard, under standard conditions, so atmospheric pressure, normal temperatures. So if the physicists are able to make helium react with sodium under high pressures, it's still 
let's say, a, um, a piece of valid chemistry for helium. So maybe this is part of what clouds our judgment. We look at, uh, we look at the periodic table with its elements under a particular set of conditions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Um, but on the other hand, we do live under the conditions of atmospheric pressure and 298. Okay, so fair enough. We, we're more interested in that periodic table. So I, I agree with you. In, in a way, I slipped that in as a way of saying, if you're worried about putting helium in group two, don't worry too much because of this experiment. But uh, that's a little bit of sleight of hand, you know. Uh, okay. And no, it, just, it, just, it, it, it does have a logic. It does have a logic. It's just it's not within the normal framework yeah. that we tend yeah. to think about. Thank you very much. Or, or there would be an alternative periodic table for high pressure. Perhaps. Okay, so uh, what should I say? Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us uh, today. It was a very nice hour. And uh, I think that uh, your lecture is uh, a very nice way of starting so the school year for these teachers, but also a very nice way to start uh, our courses next, uh, the beginning of next October. And uh, Thank you. I, 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 grazie. <laughs> grazie also okay. on behalf of all people present here. It, it's been a great pleasure. If, if anybody has further questions, please go to my website, find my email, and I'd be happy to, to reply in, uh, in detail. So goodbye for now. It's now what, what, past one o'clock in the morning here. I've never given a lecture at midnight. It's been an interesting experience. And uh, I hope to meet you Sometime I, I was intending to come in person to this conference, but as you know, conditions are still difficult. We are Arrivederci a tutti. Here. Bye Thank bye. You very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Grazie. Buona, buonanotte, buongiorno. <laughs> buonanotte. <laughs> buonanotte. <laughs> Perfetto. Grazie, allora. grazie.